Yep, okay. Um, I'm Claire Rila. I'm actually an archaeologist, uh, but I work in IT. I'm actually working with Catalyst at the moment. Um, and I'm going to talk about open education from an archaeological perspective in particular, not just a historical perspective. So, what is open education? Well, let's start with some definitions of education. Um, one that I found in a site calling itself Cambridge Dictionary Online is the process of teaching or learning, especially in a school or college. It sounds very kind of, you know, what we'd expect from a traditional definition of education. Wikipedia has a slightly broader definition of education, the process of facilitating learning, acquisition of, and it includes skills, values, beliefs, as well as just knowledge. So open education, the definition I found is that it's actually a philosophy about how people acquire knowledge. And so it's taking a different approach to that. And I know there's been a lot of discussion in recent years about open education as this new and advanced way of coming to grips with human knowledge acquisition. But if we actually look at it, um, there's some interesting perspectives from an archaeological sense that feed into this. If we look at the idea of how we've approached education through time. There's the very conventional Victorian schoolroom. This is actually Rockhampton, and this is Helladon between Brisbane and Toowoomba in the 19th century. In the late 19th century, the um, government went around and set up a lot of schools in Queensland. And at the time, I don't know if many of you have read Thomas Hardy, but the notion of little pictures that just had to be filled up with knowledge. Children were there to receive information in a very strict and orderly way, um, which is why they're all shown busily at their books in these pictures. Uh, there's a wide cross-section of ages in the classrooms because these were typically one-room schools. And basically, the students worked their way through the set knowledge base which they were presented with until they were uh, familiar enough with the knowledge that they then in turn started teaching it themselves. So most of the girls, when they got into their early teens, became student teachers in the classroom informally and then later on teachers themselves. If we go further back through time, there's different ways in which education has been approached. Because if we think about it, education is fundamental to human beings as a species. Now, I just want to jump in here and say I'm going to use some photographs of indigenous communities, not because they represent something that's stuck in time, not because they haven't changed since the Stone Age or any of that, but simply because their life ways are different from our own and they provide an analogue of different ways that different concepts in our society can be approached. Okay, so it's as an analogue to different forms of behaviour rather than a representation of the past. So human beings are unique or relatively unique in the, in the animal world in that we've kind of sacrificed um, doing a lot of development in the womb and early on for a large brain. So in a biological sense, our young are born relatively premature um, in order to get this very big brain out intact. That means that education for us starts the moment a child is born. We still have so much to learn. If you abandon a human baby, it will die. Okay, It cannot support itself. That's not true of something like a bush turkey, which is independent from day one. Um, or a crocodile or other things. So as humans, we have to train our young. It's something that we have to do. So education is not this thing that we kind of have invented. 
it's something inherent in who we are or none of us would be here. We have to teach them pretty much everything from the start. So education is actually something that's fundamental to, we start out learning and as we learn, we teach each other and we become the, the kind of learning and teaching roles swap during our lives until we mostly teaching and less learning from being mostly learning and less teaching. And education, there of necessity occurs in very informal environments. So when we have a newborn baby and we interact with it, we're actually teaching that child. We're teaching that child about human interaction. We're teaching it about emotions. We're teaching it about regulating its emotions. We're teaching it about how our society works. And there's a lot of anthropological literature that shows that the way people treat newborn babies has so much societal baggage hanging off it, it's just enormous. Right, so let's look way back to the beginning. Okay, um, I'm going to be talking in large part about the Ice Age. And so here's a fun depiction of the Ice Age. This is obviously not anything to do with the Ice Age, particularly in Australia, where we didn't even have ice. Um, in Australia, the Ice Age was actually expressed as colder, drier climates in a lot of areas and wetter climates in other parts, depending on, because the rainfall patterns were all shifted and changed. So it's probably best if I start with doing a quick overview of the history of humanity, um, just to give you some perspective on what I'm talking about. Now, the dates for the origins of what we call anatomically modern humans, which is us, people who have uh, bodies and brains like we do, is somewhere around 100,000 years ago. Now, in the literature, there are some papers arguing for as far back as 300,000, but it's, it's in that really long ago kind of space. The last ice age started at about 120,000 years. So we are an ice age born species, if you like. I mean, we may have been there before it started, but we've spent the majority of our existence, and I've got another slide that will show that more clearly, um, as people adapted to the Ice Age, which is reflected, I think, in the temperature of this room. Um, so a lot of our approaches to the world were kind of formed from that long history we had of dealing with conditions that were quite different from what they are now. So moving on from about 100,000 years ago, um, actually, let me just talk about this skull briefly. This is a skull from southern Africa um, from a site called Kabwe, or Broken Hill. And this particular individual, who's an archaic Homo sapiens, so early anatomically modern human, actually died from an abscess behind a tooth here that ate its way up, the infection ate its way all the way up here into the sinuses through into the orbit and into the brain before it killed them. So anytime you think romantic thoughts about the past or somebody wants to introduce you to the paleo diet, um, just be very thankful that we have modern dentistry and modern medicine because the amount of pain that that must, individual must have been in when they died would be quite substantial. Um, now often in, in archeological talks and talks about early human ancestors, you see a lot of skulls, so I just wanted to show you that the kind of hun hunched over, hulking cave person is not really what our ancestors looked like. Anatomically modern means like us. This is a Neanderthal child. Neanderthals are a form of early modern human. Um, they had a slightly bigger brain than we did, but in different areas. So the prefrontal cortex, which in us is very large and is problem solving area, was smaller, but they had phenomenal memory. Um, there's some argument that we either merged with them or outcompeted them, or maybe a bit of both. So one of the first things that anatomically modern humans did was spread out across the entire world. 
we are wanderers at heart and we like to move. The fact that we have not speciated in all that period whilst being spread across literally the entire planet shows how often we move and how good we are at exchanging genetic material with each other. At about sometime before 65,000 years, um, human ancestors reached Australia. There's a site up in the Northern Territory now dated at greater than 65,000 years with a very modern suite of, of technological um, <coughs> material. And that's right in the middle of the Ice Age. The last glacial maximum, so the peak of the Ice Age before it tailors off, 18,000 years. From about 12,000 years ago, we move into the start of what's called the Holocene. So all of this is the Pleistocene. At the Holocene, we have a huge environmental shift. Everything changes. The weather patterns change. Um, there's global warming on an enormous scale as the Ice Age ends and we go into what's called an interglacial period. And what happens is for several thousand years, about 6,000 years, there's an alternating between centuries of wet and centuries of dry. Um, so there's a lot of floods, a lot of desertification. That is very challenging for humans. So for instance, if you know the area of the Middle East and the Gulf, that was actually a riverine plain until about 6,000 years ago, between 10 and 6,000 years ago, it flooded in bursts. And those floods came every few centuries and flooded hundreds of kilometers inland and people were forced to move away from that. That constant changing environment, uh, lots of changes in the environment. Obviously the, the plants, the, there was an impact on the plants and on the animals, on the ecosystems, on the rainfall patterns, everything. And people were forced to move over dramatic distances. Out of that came the development of agriculture and settled villages. And the start of the sorts of um, complex societies that led to where we are today. So we get the pyramids at about 4,000 years, the Roman Empire about 2,000 years, and then medieval castles and all that sort of jazz. So because humans are really, really, find it really, really difficult to visualize scale, um, I got some help from my son to produce this for you. So this is the last 100,000 years of human um, existence. So back here, you've got the beginning of anatomically modern humans, possibly. You've got the settlement of Australia sometime in this period over here. So as a bit of perspective, Aboriginal people have been in Australia for that entire green bit. The first fleet landed about here. So when we acknowledge the traditional owners of this country, we're not just saying words, okay? These guys have been here. If you ask them how long have you been here and they answer forever, they mean it. Europe was settled somewhere down here because it was covered in ice back here. Okay, so that's just the same thing to give you a bit of perspective. Again, because we struggle with scale, the Holocene starts back here, that last little bit. We've got agriculture, pyramids. Cleopatra is as distinct in time from the pyramids as we are from her. So we tend to collapse the past when we think back. Right, so what did education look like over that period? Well, we know that the Sumerians at about 6,000 years ago with their Canaan form had schooling. They actually set homework and you have kids who got into trouble for not doing their homework and not handing it in with their clay tablets. <laughs> so that's been a thing for a while. Um, the School of Athens, famous painting. We've got the Greeks and Romans with where education was held in high regard. We've got those notorious Victorian schoolrooms, and we have the modern schoolrooms. So is that education? Well, we have about 90,000 years where that wasn't education. Okay. And where education probably looked more like this sort of thing. People learning from each other, people discussing things, kids copying what their parents were doing, grandparents passing stuff on to children, uh, elders giving their knowledge, children actually doing stuff themselves. This is actually a well, and they're collecting water. I think it's a very sensible design well. You can't fall down that, no matter how dark it is. Okay, so how did this 
education happen? Several different ways. Um, there's straight out instruction, where we teach people how to do stuff. Um, somebody explaining, somebody telling kids information. Uh, stories and knowledge being passed on to people. Women in particular, showing children how to do things, often their own children, but sometimes others. Here's a father teaching his kids to fish. Or instructional methods. Storytelling plays a huge part in that the reason we love stories, I mean, you can see it here on the faces of these kids. We've got 90,000 years of that, okay? There's a lot that we just plug straight into with that. So it's a very powerful medium. Up here, we have a Sumerian tablet. This is one of the flood tablets, which records those floods, those devastating floods that poured into the Gulf and started off the stories that were passed down. And we'll talk about that in a bit. But the stories of the floods and the stories of these devastating impacts. And it's been shown in, in research that stories of things that have happened, including negative things, are very important for children to hear because it teaches them resilience and it teaches them how their parents and generations before them have faced challenging times and overcome them. And it actually gives them hope that when they ch face something challenging in their own lives, they can overcome it as well. And of course, bards and the role of music in storytelling is also pretty fundamental. Obviously, there was a lot of hands-on learning. Now, something that's really interesting about children in a lot of societies is they are sent out to do actual stuff. We all know about kids herding animals, particularly in Africa and places like that. Um, there's three pictures here. If you just look on public domain pictures, places where you can see public domain pictures, and you look for um, children activities, you'll see a lot of children collecting water. Okay, water is fundamental to our existence. Obviously, we can't go more than 72 hours without it. So children are taking part in an activity that's actually critical to the survival of everybody. Obviously up here, you can see from the state of these boys' clothes, they've been having a lot of fun at the same time, but they know that they're getting water for their family and what they're doing is important. And they're learning by actually doing. Now, one of the things that I mentioned with that flood tablet is you have events, especially with that flooding at the early Holocene, you had centuries of flooding and then centuries of drought and then centuries of flooding. Now, grandparents are a great method of transmitting knowledge to younger generations, but grandparents don't live for centuries, especially back when there wasn't modern medicine. So how do you transmit knowledge that has to go greater than a generation? And the answer is through codifying it into stories, into um, ways of being in the world. So one of the roles of religion in a societal sense is to transmit information that is needed for a society at greater than a generation interval. And so those stories of the floods in the Middle East have been transferred all the way down to the present. Similarly, there are Aboriginal stories of the floods in the early Holocene, um, the Glasshouse Mountains north of Brisbane, are giants who ran away from the waters that were encroaching in the east, which is a direct story of that flooding that occurred of that coastal plain at the early Holocene. So let's talk about open versus closed knowledge, okay? We might think, okay, the way that knowledge was transmitted in these societies for most of our history was very open. People taught what they knew and didn't, weren't worried about who they were teaching it to. Yes, that was true. However, there was some knowledge that was closed. Uh, there were initiations for certain members of society. There were people who had special roles. There's men's business, there's women's business, and there's this chap called John Yellen, who in the 70s studied the spatial patterning of campsites. And he discovered that in the hunter-gatherer community, because people had to share resources, it was really, really important that everybody shared stuff. Because if you're a hunter-gatherer and you hoard, other people in your group are going to starve. And then they won't be there to share with you 
if you haven't got food resources. Um, so it's absolutely critical that hunter-gatherers share their resources with each other. And so as a result, what you can see here, it's hard to see from this partial picture, and unfortunately I wasn't able to get a full one, but a lot of hunter-gatherer communities, when you look at how they position their living spaces, A, they have open doorways. They don't ha close the doorways at all. Everybody must be able to see what everyone else is doing because then they know if anybody's hoarding anything and that can be threatening to the whole group. They tend to face each other for that reason. They tend to have communal fireplaces and a lot of group shared activities, particularly around food processing and particularly around the larger stuff. So um, in some of these analog communities, Men will go out hunting larger animals, women will do hunting and gathering with the children, and they'll snack along the way, both groups will. When there's a lot of resources, they bring them back, they parcel them out, they share them out, and they look after each other. We know that back as far as about 100,000 years ago, humans were looking after each other. We have examples of skeletons where people have suffered horrific injuries that they would not have been able to sustain themselves, and they were looked after by the group. So again, that's something we do. So in order to enforce this sharing ethic in a societal sense, uh, people were supposed to be accountable to each other. And this is one of the things about the open aspects of knowledge. When people uh, share openly, accountability goes with that. You can't share some stuff and not others um, because that generates suspicion. The only ones who can get away with that are the people who deal with dangerous stuff, okay? So people who deal with magic uh, or any of the kind of really dangerous information. We can see here somebody who's got a replica of an American plane on their head uh, performing some ritual. That we don't know exactly why, but we can imagine from the analogous situations that that was regarded as dangerous information that he was dealing with to keep the group safe. Those individuals did sequester themselves. So the only huts that face in the opposite direction are the huts of these shaman, witch doctors, whatever, the, the class of people in society that dealt with dangerous uh, knowledge. That was knowledge that was obtained through a lot of severe trial and effort and through which you had to pass numerous tests in order to be accepted into that realm. And these people lived a very interesting life in their communities because they were trusted to a point, but they were also not trusted uh, because they were on that fringe and they weren't part of that open sharing ethic. So the minute you start to shut things down and become proprietary about information, you lose part of the community's trust. They will accept that there's things that you have to do to keep them safe, but you will also lose a percentage of that trust. However, it can also be a means of pulling parts of the community more tightly together. So the reason for men's business and women's business it's not some kind of neat stereotype, gender stereotyping, but it's actually um, to pull those particular communities that have particular roles more closely together in the context of those roles themselves. Related to that, um, it's quite interesting that when people have studied warfare in earlier societies, most pre-industrial societies had ceremonies attached to warfare and they had ceremonies that surrounded people who were going to indulge in warfare, and then ceremonies to reintegrate those people back into society. And what those ceremonies were about were from saying, you're going to do stuff that's not socially acceptable in regular living. We're now gonna do a ceremony that removes you from this nicely integrated sharing environment that we have and puts you slightly on the outside in this dangerous knowledge area. And that ceremony will mean that when you do that stuff that we really don't approve of, you're not doing it as part of our group in a normal sense. 
We then have a ceremony when that ends to reintegrate you into the, the group so you can put all that stuff behind you and become part of the group. And then your behavior has to go back to being what it was before and you put all that behind you. And that people have actually looked at that because it's part of the issues in our modern society that we have, that we don't have any of those ceremonies. And so people are just cut off and left, hanging, knowing that they've committed atrocious acts and with no way of processing that. But that's a slight direct digression. So the basic point here is that there has always been a separation between open knowledge and closed or proprietary knowledge but it comes with different roles in society and it comes with certain amounts of societal cost. And so people need to be aware of what choices they're making around that. Okay, so getting back to the kind of archaeological model of education, how do people learn most effectively? It's something that modern educators spend a lot of time looking into and archaeologists say, well, let's look at how we've learned effectively for most of human history so that we can actually look at what's working and what's not in our modern context. Because we all know that the Victorian classroom had severe limitations um, and we've all been trying to move beyond that. So one of the main things that is a hallmark of education in the broadest sense, in the archaeological sense, is interaction. And that's interaction in a lot of different ways. Primarily interaction with other humans. Okay, people collaborating, working together, learning from each other, learning stuff together. So here we've got a working group working together on something. Here we have a study group. They're interacting a little bit with each other, but mostly with the material, with each other to bounce things off. Interacting with the environment. And here we can see a child learning through an older female relative, presumably, uh, what's okay and what's not in this interaction with the environment. We're doing an activity in the river. We're probably catching little fish or um, crayfish or something. And suddenly there's a massive rainstorm. Oh, it's okay. We can just laugh and put a leaf over our head. We don't have to get stressed about that. And we learn by interacting with things for example, a musical instrument. And then the people around us learn from the effect on the emotions of that music that's produced by the person interacting with that thing. So in most of these, we don't really separate from that interaction with humans. There's always some interaction with other humans that's part of the, <coughs> what's happening. Something else that's fundamental that's come out of the archaeological research is looking at group size. Um, there's a, a field called evolutionary biology, which says that since we spent 90,000 years minimum uh, living in a particular way, and we've only lived that very short period in a very different way, um, we should look at what's influencing our biology and what's then influencing our psychology from that long period. And so evolutionary biology tries to explain human psychology from the perspective of that long period in the archaeological record. And by looking at that, we can say that optimum group size, if you want to get anything effective done, if you want to actually have work being done, so there's something uh, progressing in a useful way, you need less than six people. Up to six is the maximum. If you put more than six humans together, you get a party. Okay, <laughs> It's just the way it works. And you can watch this in your own interactions. Um, if you get larger groups trying to work together, they will tend to break down into smaller groups until you get six or less. It's just the way it works. If anybody's ever played role-playing games, if you have more than six people, it just ain't going to work. <laughs> well, not well. Okay, so examples of groups where there's less than six. Again, it's really interesting looking at the pictures that are available on public domain websites because when you look at the groups that are working effectively and you count the number of people, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, six or less. Okay, that's what works. 
Um, again, down here, collaboration, this one's called. Six people's hands all together. Study group, three people shown. And this has bearings on, obviously, education, which we'll cover in a moment, but generally in our lives and our workplaces. So if you're trying to work on a project and you've got a team and you've got more than six people, you've got a party, not a team. Okay. Right, so examples of more than groups of more than six people because obviously we need more than six people. And archaeologically, as I said, although we spread out across the entire world in order to keep us all one species, we had to regularly exchange genetic material, which meant getting together in large groups so that people could meet um, partners of across wider genetic diversity. So we've got a meeting, a large conference, such as this one with a plenary session or some other large meeting. We have the modern classroom. And we have a party, a genuine party. Now, um, what's interesting in this picture of modern classroom is the kids are subdivided into little groups. And I don't know if there's any teachers in the room, but if you subdivide kids into little groups, again, gee, if you put them in groups of six or less, it actually works. <laughs> More than that, not so much. OK. Another aspect of um, archaeological education is the role of mistakes. Now, other people have covered this in other talks today, so it's quite interesting. In the traditional uh, education realm that a lot of us grew up in, the big red cross on your work was something to be feared. It left you feeling like that when your work ended up like that, okay? That was a mistake, and it was dreadful, and it was something to avoid. And this is just odd. Something as an adult that I've realized that we have made such a fundamental mistake in is this whole realm. Because this is not how it works. Human beings learn by making mistakes. And as people have talked about in other talks, when you give kids the opportunity to try something, and if it doesn't work, just self-correct and try it again, they keep learning and they don't end up like this. And this is something that I actually saw. You can have this face on a kid when they're making mistakes. And that's what we want because that's effective. This kid is actually learning something. This kid is just learning to avoid that. And I saw this in my own son when he was about three years old. Um, because I was already doing stuff on computers, he wanted to play on the computer. And so I thought, well, I don't want him playing first-person shooter games, so I'm going to get him educational software. And I wasn't serious about it. I wasn't trying to teach him to read or any of that jazz, but I just thought, well, I'll just get him some educational software. So I got him little phonetics stuff and all of that sort of jazz. And he was like this. He would do the wrong thing and he would laugh until he nearly fell off his chair because if he chose the wrong sound, the little ants that were trying to build a word would go that, and make all these funny little noises. And he thought it was absolutely hysterical. And at one point I thought, oh, this is actually not a good thing because he's learning the wrong thing, because he's always choosing the wrong thing, because he loves the sound that they make when it's wrong. And then I forced myself not to intervene because he was having such a ball. It was something I didn't want to interrupt. And I stood and I watched him. And I thought, you know, he can't consistently choose the wrong sound unless he knows which one is the right sound. <laughs> and sure enough, when he was about five, we'd been out shopping and I'd bought a copy of Green Eggs and Ham and I tossed it down on the coffee table to read to the kids later and I was unpacking the groceries. And I turned around and he'd picked it up and was reading it aloud to his sister. And I went, you can read? And I hadn't taught him to read. He just played with these games. Nobody had, like even the games, although they were educational, they were kind of open-ended. They weren't, you start here and you work your way through and hey, by the end you're reading. They would just explore these different things and do all these different activities. And he'd learned to read, even words like mountain. And I was just gobsmacked. And that was through this, okay, making heaps and heaps of mistakes. And if you can do that, if you can catch a way for the mistakes to be fun and it to be okay 
A, you end up with a mental health outcome that's a lot better for everybody, and you also have much more effective learning. So, to wrap it all up, basically, society and the way we live is all about choices. And something that people tend to forget, in most part, is that money and finances, because one of the things that open education tries to move away from is very high cost courses. Money is something we dreamt up, okay? It doesn't exist. We made it up. It's a giant fantasy that we all take part in, which seems bizarre because a lot of us, it rules our lives and it causes a lot of misery and suffering and all those things, and yet we made it up. We could choose to not do it at any time, okay? At some point in the past, way back when we were starting agriculture and we started to exchange things with each other, we went, okay, well, I'm going to give you this sheep and then next time your wheat field's got some surplus, I'd like you to give that to me. And that grew into money and we are where we are today. We can undo that. We can change direction. We can do it differently. So we don't have to charge loads of money for courses and education. Sure, everybody needs to eat. But everybody ate in prehistory when there was no money. Eating and money are not two things that go together. We've made them go together, and that's a societal choice. Um, how we structure our classrooms, whether we have groups of kids collaborating on stuff or whether we just have a teacher at the front imparting knowledge, the way that we do that is, again, our choice. Okay. Sometimes it feels like we're up against this establishment that's so huge and overbearing. It's there because we put it there, all of us together. We can change it at any time. We built our society. We can build it differently any time we want. In our workplaces, we can choose how we work. Um, we can choose to do things that are more effective, that have better outcomes for everyone. So if archaeology teaches us anything, it's that loads of different ways of approaching the world all work for human beings. We can do that any way we want, um, and we can make those choices. We have the technology now to make a lot more choices than we did 100 years ago. So it's time to start looking at how we want to implement some of that. And a lot of that's already going on. That's why we're having these sorts of discussions, because people are starting to realize, hey, we can do this differently. So open education is actually what we've always been doing throughout human history. I have a few pointers. Keep your group size at less than six unless you want to have a party. Um, make it real. Kids have spent all of human history doing real stuff, getting water for the family, helping out, learning to do the real stuff. They won't want to do something esoteric and abstract that has no bearing on the real world. Um, one of the great failings of our education system, I think, at the moment is that we teach kids about voting and stuff when they're 11, and they don't care because it has nothing to do with their world. At 18, when they're leaving school and starting to learn to actually need to vote, we don't do anything with that, so it's kind of backwards. Um, so if you give kids projects that have a real outcome, Particularly something in the real world. Um, when my kids were at school, we were in the Middle East for a while and they went to school there. The teacher, at some point, there was a giant earthquake in Haiti and it was all over the news. And the kids came into school because class size was really small. It was quite a small school. And the kids came in really concerned about what they'd seen on the news about the earthquake and wanting to help. So the teacher actually just chucked out all her plans for the rest of the year. And they started putting together how they were going to help and they sat down and had planning sessions about what they could do and she just built everything into that. So there was the maths involved in working out what parcels they were going to send to that part of the world and how much it was going to cost and how much money they needed to raise and what sort of things they were going to do to raise the money to send the stuff and the weight of the parcels and all that kind of jazz, that was maths. English was about preparing the materials to convince people to bring stuff in to send for disaster relief and all this kind of jazz. She built it all in. Those kids were so engaged for the rest of that year. The outcomes, they all did much better um, than they had been doing in all of those subjects. It was just so much. And she just said, I should have been doing this all along. I should have actually been teaching them 
in the context of something that they're actually doing that makes a difference. And along with that, it's not about that red X. It's not about being judged for what you do. It's not about somebody looking at you and assessing you and what, what you're doing. It's about whether it works or it doesn't work. Okay, that's how it's always been. If you set out and you've got a grand idea about how to hunt a buck that no one's ever thought of before and you try it out, it either works or it doesn't work. And if it doesn't work, you're a bit hungry that day and you're going to try harder and do something different the next day. You don't need somebody saying, oh, well, buck hunting, no, you failed that one. You know, that, that's not required. That's already built in. And it can be the same in the things we do. If we set kids challenges to do stuff that um, it works or it doesn't work, then it's built in. And it's not an it's not a emotional judgment. And then... Yeah, a reminder, we create our society, so do you exercise your choices. When you're old enough to use that ballot paper, use it wisely to create the society that you want. Um, in your workplaces, try to find the environments that actually foster uh, the direction that you'd like things to go. Okay, and I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet, which is the Yugambe people, and the traditional owners of the whole of Australia. Um, and then my employer catalyst and everybody else that's listed up there. Thank you. We have time for a few quick questions. Yeah, I particularly um, <clears throat> really enjoy that uh, notion that you brought up of the Red Cross. Um, because so, yeah, I'm a teacher myself and I've always looked at that kind of thing as a point of view of you give them a piece of paper and they work really hard on it and they stress over it and then they kind of submit this thing and then when they get it back and there's just a cross on it with a vague explanation and they kind of go, oh, okay, well, that 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 uh, there must be something wrong with me, you know, that, that kind of undermines my confidence. And there's no explanation of in the moment, okay, you know, is it this way or is it that way? You know, does this work, does this not work? And after a while, the kid just stops trying and they just, you know, they'll just leave the paper blank. And that's when they start to flounder. The other thing about group sizes is um, one of the subjects that I teach is drama. And I can definitely get behind that. Anything bigger than six and you've got chaos. However, in a whole class context, if you're talking to the entire class, that's the story time. Yeah. And that's the thing that needs to be engaging and entertaining and, and capture their imagination. Um, so I really enjoyed that, uh, that notion because that kind of um, reinforced what I already believe. <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> okay, thanks. So, um, in my teaching style, I'm kind of like the super expert, and it's very hard to get my students to do things for themselves because they know that I know. Um, so, I'm, I sort of want to know whether you think there's a place both for sort of the extroverted, plugged in teacher um, and the sort of expert who's like kind of the shaman or or something like that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, in those pictures, if I can gallop back, I don't know if it's going to go fast enough, but um, the role of the mentor is critical. I mean, it's something that I didn't really spend a lot of time on, but, uh, you know, like this chap here, imparting his knowledge, people who have huge amounts of knowledge, that will be respected. Uh, by people who are wanting to learn. And as long as they're not disengaged, they'll want to get, use you as a resource to get that knowledge. And it's all about how that's done. So um, if you were to just stand up and le lecture and drone on at the front of the classroom, people are going to fall asleep. <laughs> I heard the definition of a lecturer is someone who talks in someone else's sleep. Um, but if, as I'm sure you do, you actually get down and you engage with the kids and you use yourself as a font of knowledge as, as a resource that they can tap. Hey, we're really stuck with this and we have no idea. And you can come along and go, huh, have you thought of looking at it this way?
then that opens it up. And yeah, so I definitely think there's a role for subject matter experts, there's a role for mentoring. Um, and as the previous chap said, you know, in that kind of story giving, if you've got huge amounts of knowledge and, and you've got a lovely extroverted way of delivering that, then that's brilliant. That will definitely engage. So I, I work with people who are um, a lot better facilitators, I guess, than I am. And I think the combination um, yeah. is, is sort of valuable. Yeah, definitely. Last question. Um, I teach at uni, and so I've got a lot of students who come from overseas. Yep. Um, and looking back at your the big red cross slide, um, oh yeah, we have a lot of local students who go, oh, big red cross, stop engaging. So same sort of experience at uni. Um, I also have those students from overseas, and they have a culture of, oh, I failed that. When can I resubmit? Yeah. Right? So we don't have that in our particular culture because we're done and dusted, that's it, you've got so many marks, we move on. We don't really have that revisit that option, whereas a lot of other cultures do. So I've I'm, I'm always found this very um, sort of a challenging kind of approach because other people, they do want to resubmit and they do want to do a better job and they do want to learn from that mistake. But we've kind of got it built into our teaching culture that we don't allow that or we just don't have time for it. Yeah, so what I said there was what people learn from that is to avoid that. And people learn to avoid that in different ways. Some will give up and some will go, I'm going to make sure that I don't get that wrong ever again. In and my workshops, that's one of the things that I've been trying to do there is, oh, that's not working yet. You know, you provide that mentor thing in your workshops and you get them to go in a different direction. Yeah. Um, and that's that opportunity. I don't know. I don't really have the flip classroom kind of thing, but it's... We've tried to minimise our lecture time and try and increase our workshop time. Exactly. And that's paid huge dividends in it. So. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. Okie dokie.